how come God seems to change from old to new? And it's like there's this angry, mean God, and now there's suddenly this nice, kind, and loving God. But that's not actually the way it works. You see, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's unchanging. And so during this series, we are looking at where was Jesus before he took on flesh? This little video describes this language used in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, which is separate from an angel, one of many messengers. This messenger, this one who shows up, is distinct because whenever he shows up, he acts just like God. He does what God does, and people praise him as if he was God. So in some way, the angel of the Lord is very unique, and many people often think that is Jesus before he took on flesh, which can be really intriguing and at times also really challenging. See, last week we considered how the angel of the Lord showed up to Hagar, the Egyptian servant of Abraham, who had bore him a son and then was cast out. And God had made these great promises to his people to Abraham and Abraham's descendants. And even though Abraham's son Ishmael was not the one God had chosen, he still gave a great blessing and a promise to Hagar. And we heard last week that we have a God who hears. He sees our pain and he hears our cries and he's not absent. And the Old Testament is filled with this promise that when we are hurting, when we are in pain, when we feel like God is far from us, He hears us, and he comes to us to comfort. Today, as we continue the story, we see he does that in some pretty remarkable ways. But first, I want to share something about myself that many of you may know and some of you may not. If possible, when possible, I am a bit of a pyro. Anybody else in here? Like, I really enjoy fire. Am I the only person who likes that? There's something about sitting around a fire that is just really wonderful and relaxing, as long as the fire's in its right place, right? If my house was on fire, I don't think I'd be enjoying it. But sitting around a bonfire or a little fire pit, I will sit there for hours. And in fact, a few years ago on one of my hiking trips, uh, we wanted to make a little fire and cook some food, and so I started making a fire, and it started sprinkling just enough to make making a fire tough but not enough to say I don't want to sit by one. And I spent like an hour and a half trying to make this fire, and I finally got it going, and all the guys I was camping with said, that's cool, but we're going to go to bed now. (laughs) So I sat there for about 10 minutes and then went to bed myself because it started pouring and put the fire out after all that work. About a decade ago, I had discovered how powerful fires can be for uniting people because I lived in a little apartment complex in downtown Omaha, And we all had these tiny little apartments, but this little backyard we shared. And I put a fire pit in there, and unexpectedly, it became the life of the neighborhood. We started having fires in that fire pit probably five or six nights a week. And sometimes I would come home, and people I I didn't know were using the fire pit. And I'd say, hey, I'm Adam. I live here. And they're like, oh, yeah, we know so-and-so who knows so-and-so who told us that you have fires here, and we could just come and have a fire any time cool. And I got to know a lot of new people that way. And and so as I was discovering this power of fire, I was asked at the church I worked at at the time, hey, would you teach a little small group one day class about like, how can you connect with your neighbors and build some community? So I decided to teach about the power of a fire. And we sat there and we talked and I said, look, I promise if you start a little bonfire someplace where people can see it, and then you just invite them to come and join, they will. And not only will they join, they'll start opening up and sharing more about themselves. And it works like a charm every time. In fact, if you want to challenge me on this, get a little fire pit, put it at the end of your driveway, and just invite your neighbors and do it more than once. Like, don't just do it one time because they might be a little intimidated. What's their ulterior motive the first time, right? But if you do it regularly, you will meet new people. I promise. So I, I do this little class. And right at the end as we're finishing up, we hear this loud bang. Like, that was strange. What in the world? So we finish up and we go outside. And sure enough, there is a huge crowd gathered on the fence next to the church. And that fence overlooked the interstate. 
So we go over to be nosy neighbors and see what's going on. And there on the interstate exit ramp, right next to our church building, was a semi-truck that had exploded and was on fire. And I laughed at the irony that after spending an hour telling people how fire draws a crowd, there was a crowd watching the fire burn. And thankfully, the driver had gotten out in time, nobody was hurt, but in a matter of minutes, the whole cab and the whole trailer just gone. And it was incredible to watch. You see, fire has this power to unite people. And if you couple fire with food, you'll have friends for life. I I guarantee it. Today, as we look at the angel of the Lord, we will see him show up in fire in a pretty profound way. And there in that fire, God doesn't only hear the cries of his people and see the pain they're in. In that fire and through that fire, God rescues and leads his people into salvation. If you'd like to follow along, we're going to begin in Exodus chapter 3. You can follow along on your phone if you'd like. We are comfortable with those in this place. You can follow along in a physical Bible if you have one. Exodus chapter 3 is where we're going to start. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses, like the rest of us, said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. See, if you don't know Moses' story, let me tell you how he ended up in this wilderness. Moses was a Hebrew-born man, and at the time, Hebrews, uh, the, the Israelites, they were enslaved in Egypt, and they were growing to be this mighty nation, and so the Egyptian pharaoh was afraid that they would rise up and rebel. And so he passed a law before Moses was born that said every male that is born to Hebrew women should be thrown in the river and killed. And the Egyptian midw- or the Hebrew midwives said, we're not going to kill all these babies. We, we just can't do that. And, and so they started coming up with excuses like, oh, the woman had the baby before I could get there, so there's nothing I could do. And they started making these excuses to save these children's lives. Well, Moses was born and his mom couldn't bring herself to kill him. And so she makes a little basket and puts him in the river and floats him down the river in the hopes that he'd be saved. And lo and behold... Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses as a baby crying in the river and she pulls him out and rescues him and so Moses grows up in the household of Pharaoh. He has all of the food available to him, all of the education, all of the lavish lifestyle of an Egyptian king is afforded to him and Moses lives in great comfort while his people are suffering. Sure enough, when he gets a little older, about 40, he discovers that his people are hurting and suffering, and it breaks his heart. And one day, he sees one of his Egyptian brothers beating one of his Hebrew brothers, not actual blood brothers, but related in some sense, and he sees him beating him, and so he stops the man by killing the man. And then he's afraid, so he hides the body in sand. If you've ever seen any true crime shows, you know that hiding a body in sand where the wind will blow it away is not a good place to do it. There are much better ways to dispose of a body, right? And and so sure enough, Moses is afraid that he's going to be found out as a murderer. So he runs away. For 40 years, he's in the wilderness, wandering. That's where he meets this woman he marries. That's where here now, as he's tending these flock, God meets with him. And Moses, like the rest of us, sees a fire burning and is drawn in. What is happening over there? And he stops to look. And then comes this. God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. Now, could you imagine stopping to see a fire and then the fire begins to speak to you? I would wonder what I ate for breakfast that morning. Moses, he stops and it says, the angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame. And then it says, God calls out to him. 
The angel of the Lord is God speaking to Moses. And Moses responds, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. See, throughout scripture, wherever God appears, wherever God shows up, that place becomes a holy place. When God's presence is with us, it changes everything about the place we're in. And your feet were considered to be dirty and filthy and unclean because you walked around in sandals all day long. It's that time of the year where I'm beginning to get my tan lines on my feet from my sandals, and it's great. But every time I shower, I wonder, are my feet dirty or just tanned? I can't tell. Every time God shows up, the people are called to recognize that something special is there in that place. And everything's different. And so Moses is instructed, take off your sandals and act, saying this ground is no longer dirty. It's no longer unclean. This ground is actually something special and something sacred. There was a season in my life where I hated shoes. I still do, but now I'm old enough to know I should wear them. But there's a season where I was young enough to not care what people thought or care what they told me to do. And so I would go around barefoot all the time. Literally, I'd keep sandals underneath my driver's seat so that when I got to a gas station or someplace and realized I'd forgotten my sandals, I could just grab those and put them on just long enough to go inside. Well, this didn't fly too well with some of the older people at the church I worked at. They were really bothered by how gross it was that I was walking around barefoot everywhere. And it didn't help that junior high kids in the middle of December in Nebraska were walking around barefoot saying, well, Adam does it, why can't we? And so... They said, you need to start putting on shoes. And I started reading about the Bible and places like this, you know, where taking off your shoes was a sign of something holy. So I made up an excuse for why I had no shoes on. It's like, look, I take my shoes off so that wherever I walk, I can be reminded God is with me. And then when I'm reminded he's with me, I can live as one who goes with God. Now that satisfied all the old women of the church who were mad. Like, well, that's kind of neat, even though it's totally a made up excuse. But the more I started telling people that, the more I started believing it. And so I would actually feel the ground beneath my toes and be reminded, God, you are with me. How does that change this circumstance or this situation? God, you are with me. How does that change the way I live and the way I treat others and the way I think about others if you're with me? God, he calls out to Moses, says, take off your sandals. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. There's a part of me that thinks perhaps he was afraid because it was such a powerful moment. Wow, I'm in the presence of God. But I wonder if perhaps he was afraid because that man who had been buried in the sand came back to his mind. How could a man like me who did a thing like that, who's been in hiding for 40 years, stand before God and look him in the face? Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Here in this moment where God's presence has changed everything, where Moses is afraid to look at God and he's not sure he can stand there before him, here in this place in the wilderness, God speaks. I've heard your cries, I've seen your pain. Behold, I'm going to send you to go and deliver them. As the story unfolds, Moses 
tries to come up with every excuse possible not to go, as I would as well. Well, God, who am I to go? Well, who are you to go? What if they don't like it? Like, what if I don't have words? And time and time again, Moses comes up with these excuses. And time and time again, God says, it doesn't matter. I am who I am. Trust me, it'll be okay. I am who I am. You don't need to fear or worry. I'll take care of it. And I'll fulfill what I've promised. And Moses goes and there's a series of all kinds of crazy events, some plagues and some bad stuff that happens. And then finally, finally after Pharaoh's son dies, does Pharaoh agree, you can go and you can worship your God freely. And so the, or the Israelites, they all pack their stuff up and they begin to go. And in chapter 13, it says this in chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. God, he finally rescues them, and they're free to go. And God himself is leading in this miraculous way. You see, they're in the desert, so a cloud by day would be wonderful to shade them and keep them from the heat. And if you've ever been in the desert, you know at night it gets a little cold. And there's this pillar of fire that goes to not only keep them warm, but light their way before them every day. God goes with them to protect them, to deliver them, to bring them out of their slavery and into his promises. In the next chapter, there comes a challenge. You see, they come across the sea, the Red Sea. And there they are trapped. Because it's too big to cross, they don't have boats, and they hear the sound of the Egyptian army coming. Pharaoh realized he made a mistake, so he changes his mind. He wishes to keep them enslaved a little longer. And they hear the sound of this great and mighty army coming against them. Now what? God, I thought you were with me, and now we're just going to die here looking out on the salvation I thought you'd promised. And so it says this about that same pillar of fire and cloud in verse nine, four, or chapter 14, verse 19. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Here in this moment where they're desperate and afraid they will die, God's faithful promise that he will deliver them is fulfilled. And it's fulfilled by the angel of the Lord moving from in front of them to behind them. Creating chaos and confusion, the Egyptian soldiers, they could not see where they were going, confused. It delayed their arrival long enough for all the Israelites and the Egyptians who were with them to walk across some dry land and be saved. Where is Jesus in the Old Testament? He's with his people. God has come to deliver them out of slavery and bondage and sin, out of their suffering and their sorrow. God has heard their cry, so that I will go with you, and I will be who I am. Today, as we don't live in an era where God leads us by a pillar of fire, though that would be awesome, and we're not physically enslaved for the most part to other people, where is this same Jesus for us today? Well, this same Jesus still goes with us. He still goes before us. He leads the way to rescue us from every hurt and pain and suffering. So when we find ourselves trapped in that addiction, those relationships that are miserable and falling apart, when we find ourselves uncertain, what's next for me, God? He continues to lead us with his presence. Had I done a good job planning and preparing, I probably would have picked this text for next week. Because next week is what's known as Pentecost in the church. 
And if you're not familiar with Pentecost, it was a celebration that came 50 days after Easter. And on Pentecost, the year that Jesus died, on that celebration, the church was all gathered to pray, and something incredible happened. The Spirit came upon them like tongues of fire. The imagery here of the Old Testament fire that leads and guides and protects and delivers. This same fire comes through the Holy Spirit to his people there. And you and I have been given the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That same spirit that was there when he died and rose him to life that came like fire in Pentecost. We have been given. We've been given that spirit through baptism and we are promised. Whenever we come and we eat and we drink this meal, God is with us. So what do we do with our pain and our hurts and our suffering our failures and our relationships that seem to be at odds? What do we do when we say, God, I need you to rescue me? Like the Israelites, we come to his presence. So let you go before me. May you be the one who shelters and protects. May you be the one who provides when I'm hurting. We do so here in this meal because when Jesus was about to suffer himself, He made a promise. This is my body. This is my blood. So we eat and we drink and we know that the same God who led the Israelites out of Egypt is the same God who would give himself fully that we could be delivered from all of our hurt and sin and shame and brokenness. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you. You are faithful. Just as you led your people through a pillar of fire, just as you appeared to Moses in a burning bush, God, you gave your spirit to the church like tongues of fire. You have promised that wherever we need deliverance, you will be with us. Wherever we need you to rescue us, you will be there. So God, we confess to you that we are sinful people by nature. Far too often we turn and seek to rescue ourselves, to do it on our own strength and our own accord. We pray that today as we receive your body and blood, God, you would fill us with hope that right now in this moment we are on holy ground for you are with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you will always rescue. So we cry to you in our sufferings and in our pain. We say, come, Lord Jesus, be our strength. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.